So one of the main characters of your book is Nkasi, who yeah. was born maybe uh, 1882. So if, it, if, it re if it's really so, it, he, he would have been the, the oldest person in the world ever lived. Yeah. And, and you interviewed him. I interviewed this man. Yeah. For my book on Congo, I was doing a whole series of interviews. I interviewed over 500 persons. But when I started doing this book, I knew that the average life expectancy was 42, 43 years old because of the war. So I said, like, I, I'm going to be very lucky to meet somebody age 60. And then I realized <laughs> it's 42, not because they're not elderly people, but because children die. Mm. And so I, I, at a given moment, I met people age 60, 70, 80. And at one day, I'm talking to a man with a birth certificate who is 100 years old in Congo, in the middle of a war. And the man says, like, why are you surprised? I mean, because I showed my surprise. And he was surprised because I was surprised. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, I'm a good Christian. And moreover, I've got a brother. He's 126 years old. And I said, yeah, but how long is he dead? Oh, he's still alive. He's in Kinshasa. And uh, I didn't quite believe it, but I nonetheless asked for his address to figure out for myself. And I went to the place immediately afterwards. And I sat down with the man for, for several, several days on end. And the first thing he said, like uh, in French, uh, I was born in 1882. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, that can't be. That's the year in which Virginia Woolf was born. That's impossible. But yet uh, I interviewed him and he gave me details about the 1880s and the 1890s. And at first I thought that this must have been his father's memories that had been handed over to him. But then uh, I asked further and further and I couldn't find any reason to distrust his claim that it effectively he was born at a very early time. He was certainly well above the age of 110, perhaps even well above the age of 120. And he wasn't trying to fool me. He wasn't trying to trick me. Because at every end of the interview, I went back to my place, figured out my notes, uh, developed uh, cunning questions to, to make him uh, say uh, a mistake. And every time he answered my questions, uh, it was very, very impressive. He knew the names of the first missionaries. He could give me details on the construction of the very first railway line uh, in Central Africa, mm. which he had seen as a child. He came from that region. And he could give me all the names of the stations, all the names of the engineers. Very, very impressive sort of understanding. And his appearance was, uh, did he look like 126 years old? Well, he looked pretty old. Uh, he's on the cover of the, of, of the book in the, in, the, in the Dutch and the Belgian edition. And there you see how old he is. I once saw him uh, with a naked chest. And there you, you, you really saw he was utterly, utterly old. Mm. But his whole family, I know many of the family members, they all look younger than they are. I met a guy, I thought he was my age. He was one of his, uh, you know, uh, nephews in the second degree. And I thought like he must be like 40, like something my age. And he was 65. Mm -hmm. So that family, I mean, if, if you are into cosmetics, you have to study that <laughs> family yeah. because they have something which is beyond imagination. All right. Living in the heart of Kinshasa, which is a very difficult city to get old in. Yes. Yeah. Well, according to a report which was published actually, actually today, it says that uh, Finland is the best country in the world for mothers to live and Congo is the worst one. Yeah. As in general, how is it to be a woman in Congo? It depends on the part in Congo where you're living. If you're living at the east of Congo, chances are very high that sooner or later you'll get gang raped by militia or the military because the Congolese army is behaving as badly as Congolese uh, rebel armies, militias. Uh, and so that is, uh, uh, I think it's a big shame, not just for the country, but for the planet at large. The sexual violence taking place in east of Congo just blows the imagination. And uh, it's, it's just, just really deeply unsettling. The hardest interview for me to do was with these women, uh, talking to these women, talking to their stories. That was really, really shattering. Uh, in other parts of Congo, the chance of being raped... Excuse me, uh, do, do you mean it was hardest to you because of the stories or, or because they didn't tell anything? It was hard for me to hear their stories. Yeah. Obviously, their life has been much harder than mine. But sitting in front of a woman who is telling you that she's been uh, gang raped twice throughout her life. And the first time, her husband was being chopped to pieces with machetes. And she had to lay down on the body, on the body pieces of her husband, pretending making love to him. I mean, that's the sort of violence we're talking about. So if a woman is describing this uh, almost mechanically, because she's traumatized and the only thing that gets you out of the trauma is trying to find a narrative for what you've been gone through 
And every time you tell the story in the same fashion, almost in a mechanical way, that, that, is, that is deeply unsettling. And uh, this, was, this was the one interview I had to put down my ballpoint because I couldn't write anymore. And it, I thought it was, it was very, 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 um, well, disturbed. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a historian, I'm a journalist, but I'm also a human being. And there are certain moments when, you know, when, when I'm really shocked. I had the same thing when I was in the war, uh, interviewing child soldiers, spending time with them, you know, uh, a 13-year-old to, to talking to you with, with, a, with a gun. He said, I said, what model of gun is this? I didn't recognize, it wasn't a Kalashnikov. Uh, it's called the Chechen ar army. So these are guns traveling from Chechnya mm. to Congo. And, and uh, yeah, 13 years old, and they're just pointing at you while trying to have a conversation with them. <laughs> this is uh, heavy stuff, spending the night with them in a house, in a villa, in an abandoned colonial villa with like, 30 child soldiers sleeping on the floor, and uh, you're, you're in the midst of them. That's, uh, that's heavy. Mm -hmm. That's heavy. But the thing is, the real fear pops up when you're back in Belgium. <laughs> it's, fear is like fatigue. You can't postpone it. It's very, very strange. I had my worst panic attack when I was walking with my brother in a village in Flanders the day after I had come back from Congo. It's very, very strange. Then all of a sudden, it surges up. It's like this, this river of sadness inside you popping up. Um, but talk, talking about, about the women, I think women, women in Congo have a hard time. They work a lot, uh, but they're, at the same time, they're in an incredible force of, of, of vitality uh, and power and humor as well. Uh, Congolese women are laughing all the time. If you're in Kinshasa, they're shouting, they're laughing. Even in Brussels, there are many Congolese in Brussels as well. So it's, uh, it's an ambivalent role to be a woman uh, in that country. Um, but yeah, I admire them. Mm. Very often sa I say that I've been, for my book, I've been interviewing ordinary people. But if you look at these women, very often they're extraordinary people, absolutely extraordinary people. The way they are taking care of their lives, their families, their bodies, mm. beautiful people. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite impressive. What about yourself? Were you in danger there at, at the time you were there? Yeah, I, um, I've, I've been doing many, many travels in, in Congo. I, I survived a plane crash. Uh, many things go wrong in Congo. Even plane crashes don't fully succeed, <laughs> luckily, because I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, but I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky there. Uh, it was during a tropical rainforest in the dry season. You know, climate is changing in Africa as well. And it was a very difficult uh, place to land an aircraft. And uh, we actually, we missed the landing strip and we ended up in the field next to it but we were full of kerosene. There was a ravine at the end of the landing strip. I mean, we could have, we could have gone down the ravine and mm. it would have been, we wouldn't have been having this interview right now. <laughs> and uh, when I was in the war, I went to the war, I went to visit Laurent Kunda. The name is forgotten, but at a given point, he was the Osama bin Laden of in Central Africa. And I went to interview him, had to wait, I mean, I had to search him for hours and wait for hours sitting, uh, you know, outside of the house where he was uh, having a council. And then at 11, my, my driver was afraid. He, he drove back to town. That was like a three, four hour drive. And I said like, okay, I, I'm going to have to spend the night with one of the worst warlords and his child, child, uh, child soldiers in Africa. What happened there then? I was afraid to start with. Um, then at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the evening, it's pitch dark for five hours. The guy calls you in and said like, uh, let's eat and then we'll talk, you know? And then you have an interview, but you're sitting like on a low stool uh, him, you, his counselor, and just the guy pointing a gun at you during the interview. You know, yeah. that's the sort of that's the sort of context. You have to be very careful with your questions there. Yes, it's <laughs> almost as hard as Finnish television, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but yes. it's it is uh, it is quite a, it is quite a strange situation. And then afterwards, that was perhaps even the scariest part when after he drove away, he never, nobody knew where he was sleeping. I mean, he was changing his whereabouts every night, and then we had to drive for about an hour and a half to close to the Ugandan border. But I know that they were fighting against the Mai Mai militia, which is a local militia, 30 kilometers away. And I was in a Jeep with the top of his rebel army and the top of the political wing of his uh, uh, military movement. And I said, like, if I was a Mai Mai, the best thing I could do was blow up this car. You know, and I'm sitting at the back seat. There's a minister sitting here. There's a minister sitting there. Um, they call themselves ministers. They're just counselors, just people who are in the army, not carrying a gun. And uh, you're driving through the forest, like on a rotten road. To, I thought it was pretty, uh, hmm. yeah. 
Well, as you, as you told, Congo uh, uh, seems to be like a melting pot of mm. uh, every problem in the world. <laughs> it it accumulates there. Yeah. Uh, what is the main reason for this? There are many reasons for this. The two main reasons is the weakness of the state. There is a country called Congo. There is a population that calls themselves Congolese and are very proud to be so. And then there's a complete absence of the state. There's no longer such a thing as a functional state. And this combined with the other reason, which is the riches of natural resources. The absence of a state and the presence of natural resources makes that everybody wants to get in. Congo is like, you know, it's like an old man walking at night in the Bronx, in New York, with his pockets full of diamonds. Mm. Will he be taken care of? Fat chance he won't. Mm. I mean, everybody is trying to get a hold at his riches. And mm. this is the tragedy of Congo. And it has been so for several centuries now. Congo has always had what the world economy was needing. Slaves, ivory, rubber, copper. Today, coltan in our mobile phones, we all have a bit of Congo. You know, coltan is so important. Drinkable water will be a new asset. You know, and every time world economy is needing something, Congo is having it. Mm. And in principle, that's a good thing. But in practice, it turns out that the Congolese elite is selling the stuff and the Congolese people stay utterly, utterly poor. Mm, mm. Well, the civil war of Congo is very, very brutal. And yes. uh, six million people maybe died there even more, yeah. depending on the source. Uh, and still in, in here, I mean, in Europe, we, we don't know much about yeah. that or anything about yeah. Congo. Why is that? Why, why don't yeah. we get any news from there? Because it's a complicated conflict. Because when we get conflicts in the media, it's a conflict with two sides and the good ones versus the bad ones. I mean, that's like the, the typical situation, like in Syria, whatever. And the Congolese conflict, it's perhaps not even a war anymore. It's a militarized economy. And so there are many, many players. It's, 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 it's hard to disentangle what is going on on the ground. And that's also the purpose. The conflict is meant to be uh, a, a park and, and understandable. It's meant to be complex. So that is, that is really uh, helping. And two weeks ago, I won a prize, an African prize. It's, uh, the book has been uh, rewarded several times. It was the first time African intellectuals gave a prize to me. And there was a debate with uh, this prize in Paris. And one man says, David, explain to me, seven million people have, been, have died because of the war, and nobody speaks about it in the West. Three people get killed at the Boston Marathon, and for over a week, entire global press is talking about it. Mm. How do you explain this? And I said, I don't, but it is happening. Mm. And obviously, it's terrible to be killed at the Boston Marathon. There's no doubt about it. But it's also terrible that this is long, uh, ongoing conflict in east of Congo going on, and nobody speaks about it anymore. Uh, what do you think should be done uh, to get Congo on its feet, or is it even possible? Well, many things have to happen. Um, we have the biggest contingent of blue helmets ever. Eighteen thousand soldiers are there but they don't fight they don't fight on sundays they don't like to fight uh, so they are there uh, the roads are very bad if something happened in a village they are never there in time uh, so the conflict continues and i wonder why do we send 18,000 blue helmets there and why don't we send civil servants there why doesn't the international community say like this country need more than just military assistance it also need assistance in terms of administration bureaucracy education etc and so the road ahead of congo is a very very long one we can't hope that we organize elections and the day after it's going to be like a scandinavian democracy i mean dream on it's not going to happen you need a much more structural approach to education agriculture healthcare. Um, Congo even never had local elections. Ever since the day of independence in 1960, there has never been local elections, which means that the current political class has gotten its power through means which are not the usual process of going through local, provincial and parliamentary elections. So there is a, there's so much work to be done there. There is so much work to be done there. And now the Chinese are moving in. That might be useful somehow. It's useful in terms of infrastructure, they're building roads, they're building hospitals. But the question is, uh, how will this work out in the long end? The Chinese are not there to install democracy in Congo. They don't install 
democracy in China, mm. why would they do it in Congo? <laughs> so uh, the challenges ahead are just monumental. Mm. I'm an optimist on the long term, which means I'm quite pessimistic on the short term. And sh sh should Congo uh, be separated into many different uh, countries? Yeah, you hear this idea quite often, like we should cut the country into three or four pieces and make it more manageable. The size of the country is not the problem. Canada is a big country as well. Australia is a big country as well. Uh, and ask this idea is very often uh, uh, said, formulated by, by foreigners. Ask, do a questionnaire in Congo, and ask for a national referendum. Should this country be cut into pieces? 99% of the population will say no, never. They still have this sense of belonging to that state. They're, they are proud to belong to the Congolese nation. They're ashamed of the state of their state. Mm. That's really the predicament of the Congolese people these days. Um, and I think cutting it into pieces will not solve the problem. You'll have four Congos then. Mm. <laughs> so, your new book is this one. Uh, what has been the response in, in Congo to yeah. this book? Well, it, it, in September it came out in French, which is obviously very important for the Congolese. The first batch of copies are circulating in the city of Kinshasa, but it's still too expensive. Uh, it's being sold at 28 euros. If you know that the average income of a teacher in Congo is 30 euros, you'll see that the book is uh, heavily expensive. In, in which time? 30 euros? In, in per month. Per, per month, month, yeah. 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 And uh, therefore, and he'll get, he'll get money from, from other sides. He'll ask parents for extra money, etc. So he make perhaps $400 a month. Uh, so we're now trying. Um, I, I, won, I won a very big prize in France uh, a month ago. And uh, I'll use part of that money to co-finance uh, an edition for the, for the African readers and especially the Congolese readership. And in September, October, I plan to travel there. It's a logistic nightmare in a country without roads, without bookshops, uh, without distribution centers. It is, uh, it is, I'm doing it with a bunch of friends. I'm literally uh, weighing my book now in my kitchen to see how, how many grams is one book, how many kilograms, how many tons is 10,000 books, how many of these books fit into one uh, maritime container. I mean, this is the stuff we're talking about. <laughs> and right. uh, is it cheaper to print it in Kinshasa? Yeah, it's, it's expensive and the quality is not good enough. So it's all this sort of uh, stuff. But I think it's important to make it available for local readership. The Congolese have given so much to me, I feel I should give something back to them somehow. Yeah. So whenever we talk about Africa or whatever developing yeah. country, we always talk about these sad stories yeah. and, and it's, they are suffering from that and that and that. But as you speak to me right now, you seem to be very optimistic and uh, you, you tell me the thing that it's yeah. very nice to be in Congo and yeah. you love Congolese. Yeah. And, Uh, w what are the positive yeah. sides of Congo? Luckily, there's more to Congo than just the civil war and the child soldiers and, and, the, and the sexual violence. Uh, there, is, there is something to Congo that makes it an irresistible country somehow. It's, it's a very warm country. The, you're always very welcome there. The quality of life, on the one hand, is, on a material sense, is very hard. But on a social sense, it's very, very rich. Uh, Belgium is the country with the highest suicide rates, uh, among the highest suicide rates in Europe. Uh, suicide does not happen in Congo, you know, it's, there's always a surrounding, it is always like a conviviality. And that is fantastic, the, the food is great, the music is great. You know, being in Kishasa, one evening, sitting together with a bunch of friends on, on one of the, uh, along the streets, uh, you, know, you eat, eat a goat which is, you know, 20 minutes early, we're still running around, uh, uh, fresh goat meat, and you're, and you're having a beer, and, and you're just talking, you're laughing, you're, you're talking politics. It's, uh, it's, uh, working in Congo has shown me the extremes of what it means to be human somehow. I've seen utter cruelty, utter misery, and also the extreme of human warmth. And that makes it such an ambivalent, disturbing, and yet irresistible country. How about an average Congolese person? What, what does he have? Do, does he have television, radio, newspapers? What is it like? Um, newspapers are very limited in Congo. Like the biggest newspaper sells, I think, between 1,000 and 2,000 copies a day in a country with 80 million inhabitants, in a city with 10 million inhabitants. Can you imagine? Mm. Like, newspapers actually have virtually no role at all. Uh, television is being watched 
uh, intensively in the, in the cities, especially in Kinshasa. Uh, people who can afford it will spend hours watching television. But there's no distinction anymore between music clips, uh, which are very important, and commercials. Uh, musicians make songs for breweries or for Kerrygold uh, milk powder, etc. And their songs are long commercial songs. So you see a complete blurring of the distinction between commercial and, and entertainment. And on the countryside, uh, radio will be uh, more uh, listened at. That's like the real national medium. There's one national uh, radio station. But I, I've been, uh, two years ago, I traveled for four days on a motorbike. Um, traveling through villages when nothing was happening. No war, no city, no missionaries, no non-governmental organization, nothing. And I've seen children aged five, aged six, running away from me because it was the first white man they had seen in their lives. And they hadn't even seen the white man on television because they don't have television, they even don't have radio there. Mm -hmm. And in this region, for the first time, I realized to what extent life is almost going back to pre-colonial times. It's uh, even the roads are, you can't, I mean, you have to use a motorbike or a, or a bicycle. You can't go there with a the, with the car anymore. So, and I think we were the first motorbike to pass by in like six months or something like yeah. that. There's no money anymore. Uh, banknotes are virtually inexistent. You, you, you go back to pre-monetary economy. That is really what's going on in the very heart of the Congo.